How do we deal with those questions? Do we answer them? Do we not answer them? Do we ignore them? Do we just, well, this is what I think. This isn't really important. This is just what we do. This is a tradition that we have. How do you answer religious questions? Are they important to answer? What about questions about the Bible? When someone asks us, well, what do you, th- what do you think about divorce and remarriage? Or what do you think about sin? What do we say? What about when questions come up about the existence of God? Well, does God exist? Can you prove it to me? What do we say? How do we respond? In the, the book of 1 Peter, if you want to open your Bibles there, 1 Peter chapter 3, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, when we look at the book of 1 Peter, it's written to Christians in severe persecution. They're going through trials and tribulations because of their faith, because of who they are, because of what they represent. And they're struggling because of it. Now, when we think about our lives, there's some things that we may struggle with. There's pressures from the world that we struggle with. Maybe peer pressure, maybe family pressure, maybe things that are going on. Those questions that keep coming up and maybe we're not sure how to answer. But that verse, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, gives us a very important principle. The title to my lesson this morning is, or man, again, this afternoon, I'm going to get it right. This afternoon, the title to my lesson is giving a defense. Giving a defense. We look at that word defense in the verse in chapter 3, verse 15. It comes from the Greek word apologia. And that word apologia, we get our word apologetics from. And apologetics means to state your case, to give a defense. With that in mind, Acts chapter 22, we have Paul. The account of Paul after he gets arrested by the the mob in Jerusalem in the temple. In chapter 22, verse 1, it says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. He gets arrested, he's in the temple preaching, and they, they, they grab him up and he says, Hear my defense. That word defense is that same word. Apologetics we would get. To defend, to state your case. Paul says, let me state my case. And then in, all throughout chapter 22 through chapter 26, we see time and time again, Paul stating his case, stating his um, defense for the hope that is in him. Like we see in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. In chapter 22, we have them arresting him in chapter, or verse 2 through verse 5, where he, he starts to talk about who he is, where he came from, what he was doing. He talks about how he was on the Damascus road, and how Jesus spoke to him, and then the response that then followed. How he says, Lord, I want to do what you want me to do now. So then he goes into the city, and then verse 16, a verse we all know, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins. So Paul's telling them that. He's stating his case. He's telling them who he is and why he is doing what he is doing. That's pretty important. In chapter 24 again, we see him before Felix. Verse 10 will give us another One of those same words of the defense. Verse 10 says, Then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, And as much as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. That word answer is the same word that we get our word for apologetics. To give an account. To state your case. That's what Paul was doing. So what does that mean for us? The thing, there's three things I want to look at this evening. The first one is, is being able to defend what the Bible teaches important. It's a good question, isn't it? We sit here, you know, Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night, hopefully. And we hear the preacher preach and he preaches a sermon from the Bible. And the next week he'll preach a sermon from the Bible. And we've been doing this mostly for a good portion of our lives. We hear sermons from the Bible. But when someone comes to us and asks us a question about the Bible, are we able to answer it? 
That's pretty important. Why is it important to be able to defend the scriptures? Because the Bible is the inspired word of God. Now obviously the Bible can stand on itself and it has for all these years that it's been written. Time and time again people come up against it wanting to dismiss it as just words of men. But yet here it is still. Unfallible. No problems, no contradictions. The perfect word of God. When we see the New Testament, the church being persecuted, why were they being persecuted? Because you have the Jews and you have Christians, you have the, great, the Christians, we think about Paul and the apostles, telling the Jews that they were wrong. Opposition. Questions. How many times when Jesus was teaching, questions would arise? Matthew 22 and following. They say, well, what about the resurrection? A, l- a lady gets married, he die- her husband dies, and then her, her, his brother marries her, and then her, all of the brothers after that. Well, what about this? And many times, what would Jesus say? You err not knowing the Scriptures. What did he mean? The Jews knew the Scriptures, didn't they? They studied it their whole lives, but yet they didn't know the Scriptures. Romans chapter 10, 1 and 2, he, the, Paul says, They have a zeal for God, but what? Not according to knowledge. It's important that we don't just have a zeal for God. It's important that we have it according to knowledge. That we understand what the Bible teaches. That we understand what is going on. Romans chapter 8 verse 36, it says, As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now in the context of that, it's talking about being separated from Christ. But people were dying, weren't they? Christians were dying daily for standing up for their faith. For standing up what the scriptures were teaching. That the scriptures taught that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. That He came to earth. That you just crucified Him. Acts chapter 2, when Peter was preaching that sermon, he said, you just crucified Jesus Christ, your Messiah. What are you going to do about it? They were dying for that. Many times we'll get sidetracked, well, I don't know if sidetrack's a good word, but we'll get uh, tunnel vision, per se, with certain things that the Bible teaches, and we will know about those things, which is great, which is good, divorce or remarriage or baptism or um, one church or that kind of stuff. But when you look at the Bible, it's more than just that, isn't it? It's more than just those few things. So while questions can come up and we can answer those few questions about those things, what about the other things that come up? Well, explain to me the order of Melchizedek. Why did Abraham pay tithes to Melchizedek? That's a good question. Are we able to answer it when the questions come up about contradictions in the Bible? Can we answer those questions? It's important that we're able to defend all of the Bible, not some of it, not just the New Testament, not just the Old Testament, not part of it, but all of it. Acts 20, verse 27, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. What was Paul saying? There's nothing that I have not taught you. He also says that I teach you the same thing in every house that I go to. Paul in chapter or in Philippians chapter 1 verse 17 says, "Knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel." What's the purpose of a Christian? The purpose of a Christian partly is to answer those questions. To answer those things that are important. Philippians chapter 1, and previous, early in that chapter it says, verse 7, Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of me of grace, with me of grace. In my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. That was Paul's purpose. We think he would go into the temple and what would he say? He would stand on the scriptures. Or when he went into Athens and he said, you, you worship this unknown God. Well, let me tell you about this unknown God. 
It's important to be able to answer biblical questions, religious questions, questions about if there's a God or if there is not a God. Because there has to be a starting point, correct? And obviously God is that starting point. Time had to start somewhere. There had to be a beginning. Either evolution is true or creation is true. And with that starting point, you have somewhere to go. The question, next question, next thing I want to look at this evening is how do you then answer? And this is a, something we've probably all thought about. The Bible gives us some principles. Proverbs 26 verse 4 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. And then in the very next verse it says, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. That could be a question of contradiction, couldn't it? Some might say, well, what about Proverbs 26, 4 and 5? It says, do not answer a fool. And then in the very next verse it says, answer a fool. So that seems like a contradiction. Not when you look at it. When you really look at it. It gives a principle. How many times we've been in a discussion. This happens oftentimes with my family. In the wise family, we're very prideful. We're very self-confident. We're very, we're very like to win. So when it comes to discussions of religion or politics, it usually comes to the point where somebody wants to win. It's no longer the point of just discussing. It's to the point where somebody wants to win. And the principle that we can see here in Proverbs is sometimes there's a time to answer. And sometimes there is not a time to answer. Obviously, it's going to be a judgment call. And the judgment comes in, do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. We've been in discussions where it begins to escalate. You get louder, then someone else gets louder. Then you're talking and he's talking at the same time because you both want to make a point at the same time because you want to say what you want to say. But then it's not no longer about that person's soul if it's religious, is it? It's about winning. It's about to show that person that I'm right. To say, well, look what I know. You don't even know what you're talking about. And then that's how you end up like being like him. Then answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Sometimes it's good to show someone that they do not know what they're talking about. Of course, thinking back to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, with meekness and fear. There's Bible principles. But before you can answer anything, what must you do? Before you take a test, what, ha what, what must you do? You have to study. 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Before you can answer, we have to know, we have to understand, we have to be studied. Acts 17.11 These are more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they receive the word with all readiness. And search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Verse 12. What happened after they searched the scriptures daily? Therefore many of them believed. Why did they believe? Because they searched the scriptures and said, Oh, what Paul's teaching we can find in here. It makes sense now. How many times you've been approached by someone and the question a question arises and we don't know what to say so what do we feel when we don't know what to say we kind of feel ashamed don't we we have that feeling like oh I should know this because right now with this question it gives me an opening to help to do my to plant the seed to help save someone's soul to be used by God and His Word. We have to study to find those answers. But what about those who don't believe the Bible? Even if you study the Bible and you know the Bible front cover to back cover, there are those in the world, many of those, who do not believe the Bible is the Word of God. It is just written by men for men. Principles of men. It has contradictions. It has problems. What about those people? How do you answer those people? 
Romans chapter 1 verse 20, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Look around us. Not only is it important to know what the Bible teaches, but it is also important to be able to start at that starting point of, is there a God or is there not a God? Simple apologetics. Simple ways. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to answer someone if there's a God or if there's not a God. You do not need to be a nuclear physicist to answer this question. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. With design, there has to be a designer. This pulpit. This remote control. If you put all the pieces together and threw it up or blew it up, is it going to come together as a remote? Certainly not. So what does that tell you? That somebody put this together. That there was a plan and it was created and it was designed. How much more amazing is a human body than that remote? The things we can recall in a second. Think back to when we were a child. Think back. Think about our own existence. Something doesn't come from nothing. That seems pretty simple, doesn't it? It seems pretty obvious to me. I used the example this morning. I was preaching over at Sebring. I said, my pockets are empty. Well, I have a wallet in this pocket. But there's not much money in it. But then my left pocket is empty. If I pull it out, there's no money. If I put it back in, and I pull it out again, there's no money. Now maybe, if, what if I put some paper in there? And some green dye. All the stuff that makes a dollar bill a dollar bill. I put it in there and I pull it out. Is it going to be a dollar bill? Certainly not. And if anybody has a pair of pants that can do that, I will buy them from you. I'm willing, trust me. I'm going to Freed Hardman. But something doesn't come from nothing. Design demands a designer. Simple does not go to complex. That's not how it works. The laws of science which have been proven tell us that that is not true. These are things that we have to know to be able to answer these questions. What is the purpose of answering though? With all the stuff we've talked about this morning, with everything we've looked at, with everything we've... I said it again. This evening, my mind is messed up. And I have a week-long camp coming up. I'm going to be in bad shape by the end of it. But this evening, the purpose of answering these questions, the purpose of standing up for who you are, why you are who you are, and what you believe in, isn't to show that you're right. Isn't to show that you know more Bible than some other person. It is to win a soul, isn't it? Acts chapter 26. Paul before Agrippa in verse 1 it says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. Paul, I want you to give a defense. I want you to give an account of why you're here. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which you have to do with the Jews. There I, therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. And then again, he goes through his whole account. The Damascus Road, how he was raised, and he exceeded all his... Um, What's the word I'm thinking? Students, his peers, thank you. My brain got for me that time. His peers, he exceeded all of his peers. And how when he was on the Damascus Road and he's telling them, that he's reaccounting his, his story to them again. Explaining first, take notice what he's explaining first. Himself. He's not talking about them, he's talking about himself. And then he goes on. Verse 6. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. Does the word jump out there? Hope? 
the hope of heaven. Peter said, defend for the hope of the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That hope of heaven. And that's not just a false hope. Like, I hope someone gives me a free car. That's a hope we can know. And that's why they're standing where they're standing. And standing firm on what they believe and what they're, being, what they're teaching. Who they are. Verse 24 and verse 25 of chapter 26. Now as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. How often this happens, doesn't it? We get in a conversation and we begin to make a point and someone will respond with an insult. That's a big thing in my family also. You don't even know what you're talking about. You're 20 years old. Get out of here. Well, while I am 20 and most of the times I do not know what I'm talking about, I do know what I'm talking about now. But they don't want to hear it because they got to the point where they're understanding a little bit that something's going on and they're probably not correct. So they're going to insult you. But what does Paul say in response to that? But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus. He doesn't respond in anger, does he? He doesn't respond sometimes how we want to respond. Sometimes I want to say to my family, no, you don't know what you're talking about. You silly, silly little man. Listen to me. While I am young, let me explain this to you. Why do you have to be so thick-headed? My family is some thick-headed people. I myself am a thick-headed person. But he doesn't respond with an insult. I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. Verse 28 and 29. What was Paul's purpose? He gets insulted. He's standing. He's about to get arrested. Soon he's going to die. What was his purpose? 28 and 29. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Now there's some debate as to whether that is he's being sarcastic there or if he's being sincere. But look at Paul's response in verse 29. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am except for these chains. That was Paul's purpose in giving a defense. That was Paul's purpose for stating his case. That was Paul's purpose for answering those questions. Paul, why are you here in the temple? What are you doing? Let me tell you. 1 Peter chapter 3, we looked at verse 15, but verse 16. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good in conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. We have these discussions and then we, our point comes across and they understand and say, Well, uh, a big thing in my family to saying is, Well, you're just trying to hide something. You're just putting on this facade. I said this morning, when I say something nice to my mom, I'm like, Mom, you look nice today. My father's there, who's not a member of the church, to say, Well, what do you want? I know you're up to something. Did you break something? What did you do that you're not telling us? When they defame your good as evil. Sometimes when we live our lives as Christians and we let our light shine... People don't like that. They say, well, he's, that's not real. There's something about him that he's hiding. Pat's in the Marines, and they like to give him a hard time because he's a virgin. I think it's okay to say that public. We're Christians here. But they give him a hard time about it. They defame his good as evil. Well, you must be a pansy or maybe, maybe you're just one of those mm-hmm, iffy fellows. He's just following the word. He's just doing as God would want him to do. Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The purpose of our lives as Christians is to walk this earth as lights. 
And when people are in the darkness and they're looking for something in the sense of questions, they see the light and they come to the light and say, well, why are you a light? What makes you light and what makes me darkness? What's the difference here? Are we able to state our case? Now, obviously, we're not going to have all the answers tonight. We can't go into studying the whole Bible and studying all those arguments for the existence of God. But as a Christian, not only we should want to, it's not a matter of, well, I have to do this. We should want to be able to stand, to defend that hope that is in us with meekness and fear, shouldn't we? We should be able to say, well, let me tell you about myself. I am a Christian, according to the Bible. This is why. This is why this is why I stand where I stand. This is where why where I go to church is where I go to church. And this is why there is a God, if you do not believe that there's a God. Let me tell you. Can we answer those questions? It's going to take some studying, Second Timothy two fifteen, not only of the Bible, but also of other means. Are we being diligent so we're not ashamed when those times come up? In conclusion, 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word. What does Paul tell Timothy? Be ready in season and out of season. We see, see that same principle back up in, back in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Always be ready to give a defense. Are we ready tonight? But before we can be ready... To answer those questions, we first have to look to ourselves to make sure that we're right with the Lord. Most of us here, I think, being Christians already. If our heart is not right with God, because we know what sin is, because we know that there's a God, because we know that there's going to be a time when we will be held accountable for our actions. Are we ready to meet thy God? We sing that song unprepared to meet thy God. There's going to be a time when we stand before Jesus Christ in judgment. What's he going to say? Depart from me, I never knew you. You weren't ready to answer those questions. You never stood up for who you are, why you are who you are, and what you believed in, and what you know to be the truth. You never stood up for it. Didn't Jesus say, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. How can we be ready to answer those things? 1 Timothy 4.13 How can we be ready for ourselves? It says, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. I'm from Philadelphia. I love the Eagles. I probably said this before. And I can tell you why the Eagles are going to the Super Bowl this year. That's not funny. Because Michael Vick has some mad skills at the quarterback position. He's a little injury prone. Our defensive line, they're going to get some sacks. Our running back, he has a new deal. He's happy. Our receivers, they got some top end speed. I can tell you about those things because I love it. I love watching football. I love talking football. Well, tell me why you believe in God. That's a little bit more important. That's a little bit more weightier, isn't it? If we need to come forward for any reason at all, because we have sin, because we need prayers, now's the time. I ask you to please come as together we stand and sing.